Gary Somerville is a retired Air New Zealand flight engineer who started his flying career in 1965 and was part of the flight crew on our DC-8 ZK NZC many times over the years. Now into his 80s, Gary has put together some great histories of his time in the flight engineer's seat on the DC-8, DC-10 and 747-200. See the links associated with this interview to find out more. I talked with Gary this week. Here's that interview. Gary, how long have you been out of aviation? How long have you been uh, out of the cockpit? Well, I, re I retired in uh, January 1991. So that was the end of my operational flying. Um, up until the year 2000, I was re-employed by the company as a flight simulator instructor on the Boeing 747-200. Right. And that's really where it ended, wasn't it? The era of the flight engineer with pretty well that model of aircraft, particularly uh, in Air New Zealand. And I'm wondering, what are your thoughts with the passing of that era? I guess many people knew that there were pilots up there back in the day, probably weren't so aware of the flight engineer. And given your background in maintenance, you don't see that engineering background in the cockpit anymore, do you? No, you do not. And... Um I get a little bit distressed at times when I uh, read uh, some of the events that are, that are happening in aviation today and thinking that uh, aviation would still be well served by having a professional engineer, the nuts and bolts man in the cockpit. Take us back to that beginning of the jet era. It must have been a very exciting point in aviation for someone like you in the business at that time. It was a whole new era coming in. For a small country, it was a big leap moving into the jet age. We're in the, what, the early to mid-60s. We chose the DC-8, and I'm going to ask you what you thought of that aircraft, obviously, in this interview. But um, what were the origins of Teal slash Air New Zealand's decision to go with that particular type? They had to um, get an aeroplane that would um, suit our projected route, and uh, the choices were the uh, the, the Comet, the um, Boeing 707, DC-8, and perhaps the Convair 880, and the DC-8 seemed to uh, suit our route structure um, much better, because the aeroplane could fly a lot further. Um, the aircraft had three degrees less sweep back than a 707, so it was more stable in certain conditions. It would allow us to go into Hong Kong on the bad days where the 707 perhaps couldn't handle the conditions. So there were a number of factors that came into uh, choosing the aeroplane, and those that were in the know at the time chose the 8, and I'm very pleased they did because I found it the most interesting period of my entire aviation career. What was it like to fly in the crew on that airplane? What would a typical mission be? Well, in the really early days, of course, um, I'm going back to the time pre-computers. Uh, I mean, miniaturisation had not been invented, really, and so the DJ didn't have any, uh, any computerised equipment. So we carried a navigator. The um, previous era, including the World War Two years, was uh, low speed, um, low altitude, straight wing flight. And we suddenly found that we were um, high speed, high altitude, swept wing. And it was an entirely new um, era of flying. And uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, worldwide experience to hand on. And uh, a lot of it was quite uh, experimental. Things we did were unexpected at times, simply because no one else had ever experienced it. Some things happened in the, in the aircraft that uh, were totally unexpected because no one had actually thought of it. Uh, it, was, it was very, very much a pioneering era. What sort of transition to that world of flying uh, was there for someone like you? Uh, obviously, there were the Electras that came before. I guess that was a stepping stone to this. Obviously, you had to uh, head off to the States and do some training. Tell us about what you did there. In New Zealand, as it was then, didn't have a um, flight simulator, and uh, that was something quite new. And uh, United Airlines uh, had, had all the equipment that we needed. So we hired um, 
time and instructors from United Airlines and went up to Denver and Colorado and did simulator training there. And then um, I think we were three weeks there in the flight simulator. And from um, Denver, we went down to uh, San Francisco to the uh, United Airlines maintenance base where they had um, DC-8 freighter aircraft. Right. So we learned our uh, initial flying training on uh, DC-8Fs, and we'd take off from San Francisco, fly over the uh, Sierra Nevadas into a place called Stockton, and uh, we'd go whirling around the circuit there with uh, perhaps two or three other DC-8s at the odd 707. It was quite a, a busy and rewarding experience. You don't sort of get that these days, do you? Everyone's in simulators. I guess you can imagine a time where you had one airport with multiple people training and multiple real aircraft. That's right. Without a flight simulator, the only way we could train for um, these rare emergencies like emergency descents and shutting down engines and well, multiple of things, we couldn't do with passengers on board, so it could only be done in, in the in the real aeroplane in circuit flying and uh, upper air work. There must be something different about doing those procedures in the real situation, even though simulators are fantastic now. They you know, they do recreate to a very high level of accuracy reality, uh, if you want to think of it that way. But actually doing these procedures and manoeuvres in the real aircraft, I mean, that's the real deal, isn't it? There's, there's a difference. Yeah, there certainly is a difference. Not only uh, the way you feel yourself in the aeroplane, but uh, just the, the cost of it all too. I mean, flying an aeroplane uh, without uh, revenue, very, very expensive exercise. So once you're trained up and you're ready to go, what happens? You just start getting rostered for flights. Uh, tell us about how the route network operated back in the day and what sort of flights you'd be doing, what sort of sectors? Well, a typical uh, sector would be across the Tasman, and you'd do that in, in a day. It was just a typical um, eight-hour day, like anybody else going to work, work for eight hours in a day. You'd just um, pop across to Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane, three-hour flight into the wind, and then an hour on the ground, turn around into the tailwind, two and a half hours, and you're back home. So that was just a normal working day. Um, but some of the longer flights, if we were to go to... Um, up north, we'd go um, perhaps to uh, Auckland, Fiji, one hour turn around there up to uh, Honolulu, get off there, spend uh, 24 hours there, Honolulu through to uh, Los Angeles, perhaps 24 hours there, and sometimes we'd go from there down to uh, Tahiti, and then turn around, come back to uh, Los Angeles, back to uh, Honolulu and down to Auckland, and we'd be away for something like five days on a uh, roster duty like that. And you're up, uh, I read in your information from the Flight Engineers blog site that you're up uh, through Australia as well, places like Alice Springs and Darwin well, for refuelling. That would have been interesting. Yes, well, the, the trip through to Alice Springs, I don't think it was ever repeated, a particular one. Back then there was militant unionism both in New Zealand and Australia, but... Um, it was particularly bad in Australia uh, with the New South Wales um, refuelers. They went on strike every year, twice a year, always at the uh, time of greatest disruption to the public. Like the ferries back here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But EC8 flying to Singapore or to Hong Kong did not have the legs to uh, go in on stop as the DC-10 did and later the 747, so a refuel stop was um, required en route, and it was always Sydney, until the Australians decided that uh, it was too good a thing for the New Zealanders, so we'll restrict you to uh, picking up 30 Australian passengers. Were they protecting their their patch, were they? Well, they were. I mean, uh, Qantas um, was government-owned, and they were very, very fiercely protective of Qantas and um, made sure that uh, competition was uh, not curtailed but contained. Right. So they made things very, very difficult. 
So on those days when New South Wales wasn't giving any fuel, we could carry enough fuel from Auckland to land in Sydney and pick up our passengers and then fly to a alternate uh, refuelling stop, which going to uh, Singapore was normally Darwin, and sometimes also to Hong Kong, we'd lop into Darwin for fuel, or we'd carry on to Manila, which was a uh, an hour and a quarter short of uh, Hong Kong. Right. We usually carried three pilots and the navigator, but there was only one, one flight engineer. So okay. We were considered men of steel yeah. and expected to stay awake looking over all the nuts and bolts and keeping the aeroplane flying. As Well, the flying engineer's job was to um, keep the aeroplane healthy, functioning, operating all the systems and feeding the engines, doing all the things necessary to keep the aeroplane airworthy so that the pilots could do what they do so well, and that was to fly the machine. Right. So you would you would fine-tune it so its performance parameters were as best they could be for, what, efficiency and uh, comfortable flying and fuel burn, all that sort of stuff? Well, yes. I mean, um, air conditioning and pressurisation, because you need a comfortable um, environment uh, when you're up at 39,000 feet and outside air temperature, which could get as low as minus 67 degrees, and oxygen uh, levels were so jolly low that uh, if you did lose cabin pressure, you'd have something like uh, 10 to 15 seconds of useful consciousness if you didn't go into oxygen. And that time would depend on whether you're a smoker or you're unhealthy or not, just how long you could be useful, usefully conscious. Did you do some of those um, uh, emergency descents in your training? Well, on the DC-8 we did, yes. That would have been quite dramatic, because it's a, it's a very high descent rate, isn't it? Well, you've got to get down to um, 10,000 feet is the, is the objective. But if you can't, let's say you're going to um, Hong Kong and you're going over ahead to um, New Guinea where the uh, peaks there are up to 17,000 feet. So well, let's not use the word plunge as the, new, as the news media... Yes, I see they use that word a lot, don't they? They say, yeah. I would say plummet or plunge, <laughs> where in fact it's a controlled high-rate descent. At no time is the aeroplane not under control. It's not plunging, it's not plummeting. It's uh, all designed to get the aeroplane from... Uh, a high altitude down to a level where everyone can breathe comfortably and, and, and be warm because it's damn cold up there. Yeah, for sure. Uh, your impressions of the machine as a flying machine, you've been in many crews on many aircraft types. What was your impression of the DC-8, given the era and its um, place in the uh, early history of the jet era? What was it like as a flying machine? Well, it was, uh, to me, the DC-8 era was the... The pinnacle of my flying career, actually, it was uh, it was wonderful because I was young and keen and uh, didn't mind uh, the rigours. I was just it's just wonderful being a pioneering part of uh, early aviation. Today, crews they never stop anywhere any for any appreciable time, whereas in in, in the Bishad era, the company could only negotiate rights to other countries by intergovernmental agreement. So some places would only go to twice a week. So if you went to Hong Kong or Singapore, and that was only twice a week, you'd either stay there for three days or, or four days. So it was, that was good from that point of view that um, you got to see these other countries, spend a bit of time there. Hmm. But today, of course, they're only in there for what, 10, 10 hours or 12 hours, and off they go again. The, the aircraft that, yeah, I've seen that too, um, the, it puts a big strain on the body, doesn't it, that sort of yes. uh, activity. You have to be super healthy to cope with it, I guess, these days. The DC-8 that we're specifically trying to get hold of, NZC, I know that you've flown as a part of a crew on that aircraft many times, and um, I'm just wondering what you think when you see pictures of it in its current condition. Um, I'll ask you that question first. Well, I've been watching it uh with interest for, for a number of years, following its progress when it uh, left Air New Zealand and became a, um, a freighter and then started flying out of South America. So I've been watching its progress. With the advent of um, computers and what 
just not the um, ability to uh, get images up on your TV screen. So it was easy to, and wonderful to see it, but also a bit heartbreaking to think that uh, this wonderful machine <laughs> is just uh, rotting away. Well, not for too much longer, hopefully. We'll draw a line under that. One thing that you mentioned, uh, there's plenty of things you mentioned in your papers, but one that caught my eye was a fuel issue that you had that was a bit of a mystery relating to that particular aircraft. Tell us about that. The, well, the fuel siphoning, because nobody knew anything about it back then, and um, I was very young. I was um, posted to Sydney for, for a two-year period, 1968-69, when the company first started um, flying to the Orient. So they decided to base um, five crews in, in Sydney just to do Singapore and Sydney for two years. And I think I did something like 50 trips to Hong Kong in that period. Any one base in Auckland would take uh, maybe 20 years to do 50 trips to Hong Kong these days, so it's it quite a... Uh, so you're quite familiar with the area, needless to say. Oh well, yes, I think you were, yeah. in, in three and four days off at a time, I've spent almost a year in Hong Kong. Wow, OK. Uh, but anyway, you're asking about the siphoning problem. Yes. The, um, we found there was fuel coming out of the overboard... Vents. If I was to describe this whole scenario, it would take me a long, long time because it's, it's quite a technical issue. But um, it was only it only happened on the one aeroplane, and that was ZK NZC. It seemed to only happen when I was the flight engineer on the aircraft. Oh yeah, okay. And that sort of uh, put a cat amongst the pigeons in head office in Auckland when they kept getting these reports of, of aeroplanes losing fuel. And on one occasion, I lost, um, I think, about 3,500 pounds, as it was then, pounds of fuel from uh, a critical outboard tank, and there was absolutely nothing I could do about it. So reports kept going back to Auckland, and um, they decided that there's nothing wrong with the aeroplane, obviously, is that young fellow, some of all, third from the bottom of the seniority list, so he better send somebody across to uh, find out uh, what he was doing wrong. But as it turned out, um, when the top brass from Auckland arrived to fly up to Hong Kong with us, uh, the aeroplane siphoned fuel beautifully on, from both sides, and they were sort of thunderstruck, and decided they needed to find out what was going on. So to uh, cut to the uh, chase, what now our DC-8, I'll just say the our DC-8 was fitted with a centre wing tank. That's a, a very large fuel tank in that part of the wing which passes through the body of the aircraft because that tank of course is in the pressurised area of the cabin and there was a um, inspection panel on the top of the centre wing tank that had a loose seal in fact it popped out to one side because it was, nobody knew about it when the aircraft got airborne and started to pressurise the head of the uh, cabin pressure was placed on the top of the fuel in the centre wing tank and it forced the fuel into the uh, the vent system and uh, very quickly the vent system is a uh, just a, a hollow tube that connects all the tanks together and the reason for that is that um, as the aeroplane climbs or descends and the outside air pressure uh, increases or decreases then the airspace above the fuel has to be replaced by air, so a vent system is provided for that for that purpose. When the uh, cabin pressurisation got on top of the centre wing tank fuel, it forced the fuel into the vent system, and the the outlet of the vent system is right out on the wing tip, the underside of the wing tip. The reason for that being that um, when the air in the tank goes in or out, it also takes fuel vapour with it, so it's flammable. So it's always put out near the wingtip in case, uh, say, it was a lightning strike or something like that uh, would ignite it. So, uh, so it's put way away out of uh, harm's reach. So when the fuel was, uh, the center wing tank was pressurised, the fuel would um, be forced into the vents and it would go out through the uh, overboard wingtip vents and that set up a siphon in the 
outermost tank on each side of the wing. And there was absolutely nothing that could be done about it until the um, centre wing tank itself ran out of fuel, either by being consumed by the engines or forced out the uh, out the vents. And it was a, a huge mystery until uh, the aeroplane was in the hangar undergoing a maintenance check and a young keen apprentice noticed the seal that was popped out of the side of the tank and lo and behold, problem solved. Wow. There's always a reason somewhere, eh? you just got to find it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, just um, to wrap this particular chat on the DC-8 up, I noticed that um, as high as you went was 41,000 feet, which I think was the service ceiling, and I know it was a 600-mile-an-hour machine. Wasn't there a record, DC-8 crossing the Tasman from, I think it was Brisbane to New Zealand, that, that still stands today? Am I correct there? No, I think that's correct, and the, the pilot was uh, Jeff Hyatt, Jeffrey Reed Burton Hyatt, and if you were to look up... Jeffrey Reed Burton Hyatt. On the internet, you'd find that he was a um, highly regarded um, World War II um, fighter pilot uh, up in the Pacific. I think he shot down something like three zeros in one day. Because of this particular trip from right in the core of the jet stream, of course, big, big tail, when you get tailwinds of up to 300 uh, knots coming across the Tasman and, and you can be hooting across with a grand speed of uh, something like a thousand miles an hour at times. So he got over in uh, just under two and a half hours, I think two hours 25 or something. Yeah, it's really he, moving, huh? The name then after that was Jet Speed. He was Jet Speed hired to his uh, <laughs> contemporaries. Fantastic. A great fellow, yeah. Well, we're looking forward to uh, going through this exercise of reclaiming this DC-8. I think you would agree, Gary, it is a part of, it's more than just a plane, it's an artifact of our history, and I think that uh, everyone that supports our project knows that and understands that this is really the last one. There are no others. If we let this one slip, it just becomes memories. The physical part of it is gone. So... And thank you so much for coming on and chatting about your experience with the DC-8. We could talk for a lot longer. Uh, and I'm hoping I can come back and maybe we could talk about the Electra and anything else uh, uh, that's relevant as well, maybe in the future days of this campaign, Gary. Well, thank you. And I take my hat off to you, Paul, for, the, uh, for uh, initiating this uh, rescue. It's something that's... Most of us that flew the aeroplane, in fact, if not all of us that flew the aeroplane or maintained it, or in any way was involved in the operation of the aeroplane, be they, be they office people or whoever, I mean, we all think the same, that we'd love to see them back, and uh, the fact that you're doing it is, is wonderful, and I take my hat off to you. Well, thank, thank you so you much, Gary, much. and it's for people like you that I think, you know... Um, I mean, we want to do it for everyone and future generations, but also for the, for the likes of yourself still around, still a connection to those days. And hopefully, Gary, we can get you uh, maybe uh, there for when it arrives at the wharf. Oh, boy, I'd love that. Well, don't you worry, we'll work on that. Well, thank you, Gary, and uh, hopefully we'll chat again. And uh, we'll put a link up to uh, your material so our followers, over 2,000 now, can go and read some of your uh, pieces and, and really get to know with some detail the history uh, behind all of this. Yes, well, I'd appreciate you um, giving the link to the uh, people that are interested in aviation. Certainly because, will, uh, yeah. It's what it's all about, and thank you once again.